heard that Utah has now become number one in the country for corruption. And let me explain to you why we are so corrupt. It's because we are the only state in the country that allows a lieutenant governor and a governor to run on the same ticket. That right there is a conflict of interest. Okay? We're the only state in the country that allows the lieutenant governor to be in charge of the election. Now explain to me how you lose an election that you're in charge of. You don't. That's why we got Spencer Cox. Okay? Now, there's a lot of proof out there, but this isn't really about Spencer Cox, okay? This is about our commissioners, and I am a re registered Republican, okay? For the first time in my life, I'm voting outside the Republican Party. how 
the show is going to be run, and they either like it or get out of office. Okay? So, I went home, and I just thought, I have to do something, because many of you have heard of Jen and Sophie, the two red pills. Okay? But they're up in northern Utah. I mean, they're all over the place, actually. But I thought, you know, we got to do something here on the local level. Because our government was founded to be from the bottom up, not from the top down. And even if the whole state of Utah goes to hell in a handbasket, we can keep Washington County safe and secure and following the Constitution. And that's why I started this. Okay, I'm not a public speaker. When I speak, I'm speaking from my heart and I'm speaking with passion. And I, like I said, this is the first time in my life that I've endorsed anybody but a Republican. Okay? I vetted these people. I know these people. And I believe that they have the best interest of our country. And I just got into it with Lisa Sandberg, and she's all fiercely for the Republican Party. Well, that's dangerous. You have to be fiercely devoted to your country first. And I don't mean, you know, Biden and all that. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about our country and our Constitution. And we have to be willing to stand up and fight and do whatever it takes to keep America free. And we do it at a local level. Now, I'm not sure what else I should say. Um, this is very short. He is running against
And then in 2022, this very year, his ranking was 65.5% and 18 out of 29. Now, if you figure about seven of those are Democrats, so he's really like 18th out of 22. Uh, and if you, just to give you a comparison to let you understand that this isn't partisan stuff we're talking about, uh, Senator Lincoln Fillmore is a Republican who's actually from Salt Lake County. You would think, you know, that, that he might not be the most liberty-oriented guy coming from Salt Lake County. In those four years, his lowest ranking was 80%. Uh, and one year, he actually hit 100%. So this isn't a partisan thing in that. Way. You can vote for liberty no matter what party you're in. Uh, in fact, I'll make a little quick pitch here, uh, because in addition to all the other things I do, I am chair of the Utah Libertarian Party. Uh, we don't care about your voter registration. You support our principles? Good enough for us. Um, want to give you a, a little bit of information. Um, 2019, that's the first year of this four-year term. HB 158 would have protected free speech on our college campuses, on, on, on the state, college, and university campuses. He voted no. Senate Bill 160 would have required that a police officer who's just been involved in a violent incident not turn off his body cam while he's talking to his superiors. He voted no. He let them turn off their camera while they talked about what had just gone on. Um, another thing that he did in 2019 that some of you in this room may remember um, was that they had a special session in December of that year where they passed that really awful tax reform bill that caused us all to, to, to go into action and to collect signatures and to get that thing. Not, we weren't repealing it, we were saying this, this has to go on the ballot and everybody gets to vote on this particular tax reform. He voted for that. And in fact, if you ask him, he still defends that bill. Even though it was obvious the vast majority of Utahns rejected what was in there, for very good reasons. One of the things it did was actually against the Utah Constitution, which is that it would have added 10 cents a gallon to your gasoline tax, and that was going to go into the general fund, not into the funds that are designated as our Constitution requires to do road design, road repair, road maintenance, do road construction, anything specifically related to transportation can be done with that money, but are specifically to roads, not general, it doesn't apply to tracks or something like that. But it's very specific that that's the only way that money can be used. And yet, here he supported a bill to put that and throw it into the general fund. That was, that doesn't fly. It doesn't fly with me, and I didn't fly with, with Utah. We had to collect, if you remember, I believe it was 10% uh, of signatures of people who, of the number of people who voted in the prior election. I had like five weeks to do it all. And we ended up with near, and, and we need to do that in 15 of the 29 counties. We ended up with roughly 20% in all 29 counties. So, and, and to do that in the middle of winter, I mean, that was a monumental feat, but it shows that the people of Utah can change things when they want to get up and say it's time to change things. Because uh, we've done it. We've done it. So that was a terrible bill. And again, he still defends it. Uh, 2020, I'm going to do, I'll go through these real fast. 2020, HB 132, they brought back that free speech on college campuses bill. He still voted against it. Um, HB 332 would have created school choice funding for special needs students only. So if you've got a child that really needs extra help, you can find them another form of, of teaching besides just the public schools. He voted no on that. Um, SB 173. You may have seen a, a video uh, earlier this year uh, where a guy was arrested at a public hearing up in Salt Lake City. Yeah. 
Okay. Because they didn't like his t-shirt. Like SB 173 criminalized causing too big of a disruption at a public meeting. He voted yes. Wow. 2021, SB 242 would have allowed tax credits to parents who found alternative education for their children during the COVID-19 shutdowns. So if you took your kids and you got them a tutor, you did online education, whatever, you would have gotten a tax credit for that. Senator Vickers voted no. This year, HP 125 was, was a transient room tax which would have expired at the end of this year. He voted to extend that tax. So effectively, another tax increase. And then SB 49, oh, this is, this is incredible. SB 49 removed a cap that existed in Utah law on the amount of tax incentive that can be given to a film crew from outside the state. So there was a maximum that you could give as a tax supplement to a, 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 a film crew from outside the state. He voted to remove that tax cap and say, whatever you want to agree to give them is fine by us. Give them whatever credits you want. And you know what? All of us pay for the tax credits that are given to people from outside. So I, I just want to tell you, I'm, I want to go because I think we need somebody who's going to vote better than the guy that's there. Um, yeah. You know what? Every year, the legislature deals with nearly 500 bills. It's an insane amount of legislation they have to deal with in 45 days. Now, there are some special sessions where they work on developing some things. But it's basically 45 days from start to finish, and they've got to get on it, which is one of the reasons a lot of times they don't even read the stuff they're voting on. They don't have time to read it. Um, so I, I will be honest. I may at some time cast a vote that you don't agree with. It's got to happen because there's so much of it. I will try never to do that, but I would imagine with even with just this number of people in the room, there might be a bill where there'd be two different opinions on how I should vote. So I don't guarantee that I'm going to rank 100% with everybody in this room, but I do guarantee this, I'll rank a lot higher than our current incumbent does. And so I hope that I can count on your votes. I hope you'll go back and tell friends, neighbors, help us get the word out that we need to make a change here in Utah and push towards over to yes. The first one up there, uh, repeal the grocery tax. Yes. There's not only a state tax, there's a county tax, and there's a city tax. Right. Would that be in your interest to eliminate all of the county and the city? I would prefer to remove all of the tax on unprepared food. Uh, because it's really an unfair tax. Wealthy people don't eat six meals a day. You know, they don't. A wealthy person will spend more on groceries, but it's not exponential. It doesn't follow their income. So the grocery tax is a disproportionate tax on lower income people. And what do we do? We then go and figure out some sort of agency that can figure out a way to give that money back to the people we've taken it from who couldn't actually afford to have paid that tax in the first place. So we end up we end up creating government jobs to give back money that we should have just let you keep in the first place. But, so I don't believe, as I understand it, that the legislature can repeal the city and county taxes. I, I believe that's out of their control. However, there are probably other things that the legislature can do to encourage them to go ahead and do that. That might be adjusting some other way that, that they're sending funding back to the cities and counties. But there ought to be some way to make that happen. Because when you go buy groceries, you shouldn't pay sales tax on them. There are, I think there are, if I recall correct, it's 15 or 16 states are all that have a tax on unprepared foods. You know, you're still gonna pay sales tax if you go to a restaurant. Yeah, but that's different. You're paying tax on, on something entirely different than going and buying a head of lettuce and, and, and a piece of meat. So, yes? Are you going to have any debates? Um, 
I had a debate Wednesday night at Southern Utah University. Okay. Um, at this point, I have not been contacted by anyone else. I, I've been after uh, Dixie Tech uh, because they host the Washington County Debate Commission, but I haven't been able to get a response out of them. And I think it's kind of insane because, and, you know, there isn't a Democrat in this race. There's the Republican, there's myself, there's Patricia Bradford, who was the candidate of the United Utah Party. But there's no Democrat, and, and I think they're taking something that I've seen far too often from the Utah Debate Commission, even though they're, they're affiliated, but not directly the Debate Commission. But the Utah Debate Commission is jointly run by the Democrats and Republicans. And they manipulate the polling in order to keep the rest of us out, I have to say. Uh, we were talking about, about areas of corruption. You know, the debates in Utah used to be run by the League of Women Voters, who are neutral, at least in theory. They may not always be in the positions they take, but at least they at least try to give the appearance of being neutral. Um, and as a result, our candidates got in. Now, Rob did get into the congressional debate two years ago here in, in Utah. So, so once he was polling just high enough that they let him in. Uh, but maybe that was because they thought the Democrat wasn't going to be much competition for Chris Stewart. I don't know. Uh, yeah? Are any of the media family politicians? There are a couple of writers who are. A couple of reporters in the area who are, are people that I know and have very good relationships with. So I am reaching out. I've got a thing I'm working on right now for some endorsements that if it happens, I think it will, it will I believe, be big news. I, I think it could be big news. Why Libertarian? Why your party? Um, well, I've been a Libertarian pretty much all my life, to be honest. Uh, I moved to the Libertarian Party in 1976 when presidential choices in front of me were Jerry Ford and Jimmy Carter. And I said, I was in college at the time, and I looked at that, there's got to be somebody better than these two youngers. <laughs> the only reason why I ask is because conventional wisdom says it's best to, uh, like, run as a Republican, though you could be, like, an insurgent candidacy, like John Paul, uh, Rand Paul, right? Right, right. He's more libertarian than most Republicans, but he runs on the Republican ticket. Right. Um, I... I just haven't had good relationships there for a long time. Uh, you know, although uh, one of the things that's going on there may involve a couple of prominent Republicans up in that county. So we'll see what happens. Uh, uh, basically because I, I really find that on an awful lot of issues, and particularly at the national level, uh, the Democrats and Republicans vote the same way on far too many things. Uh, I, you know, anytime the economy is uh, the economy's in the dumpster, we start a war. It doesn't matter whether the president is a Democrat or a Republican. I mean, that's always the solution. Um, you know, we've got crazy inflation going on right now. That's the Federal Reserve Bank. It's, it's national policy that's doing it. It's not some horrible thing that's happened to us. It's something that's being done to us by our own government. Um, and you know, go find, go find a Republican or a Democrat other than perhaps Rand Paul uh, or Thomas Massey who would say we really need to do something about the Federal Reserve. They're not there. They just aren't there. There's been a lot of people since like. Uh, Trump, right? Like Marjorie Mar Mar Taylor Greene and a bunch of other candidates who are ch uh, challenging the economy. Right. And I think that this is a more effective strategy of trying to hack at it from a third party. You know, it's not going to be able to get the support. What are the statistics on the person? Um, it happens. It's not common. Uh, we have we have a member in the Wyoming legislature, Marshall Burt from Green River. Uh, and we have we have several thousand actually elected libertarians around the country. Uh, most of them aren't in state legislatures. They're not in governorships. Uh, 
they are they are on city councils. They're mayors. Um, Glenn Glenn Kane Glenn Keane, uh, the, the the mayor of Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, Glenn Jacobs. Glenn Jacobs. Uh, Kane is his wrestler. Yeah, Kane was his name as a wrestler. Uh, is is the is the mayor of uh, Knoxville County uh, in in Tennessee. So we, we do have a lot of people. We have in the past who's, who's few years. Side? Who's our Riverside? Oh, oh yes, Jeff Hewitt yeah. uh, is a county commissioner in Riverside County, California. So, which which means that if you divide, there are five commissioners, if you divide the population of Riverside by five, that's more voters than there are in the state of Utah. So you can win, you know, and he's got more budget to deal with than the state of Utah. Uh, amazingly, in, at that. So, so we are winning. We're we're winning in a lot of places. We're growing like crazy here in Utah. Um, I joined the executive committee uh, six years ago, just almost six years ago now. We were just over ten thousand. We're now well over twenty. We've doubled our size in the past six years. And I think a lot of the reasons is the reason many of you are here tonight. That people are frustrated that the Republicans say one thing and they do something else far too often, you know. And 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 to your point specifically, part of it is that I see them saying one thing and doing the other thing, and I'm not sure I want to reward that. Right. Yeah. Yes. What's your stance on SB 54? SB 54. SB 54 ought to be repealed. Um, the state has no business telling a political party how it must select its candidates. A political party is an organization of individuals, right? Yeah. They ought to be able to decide who their candidates are in whatever way they choose. If you want to you want to do the, the caucus convention route? Great. You want to do a primary? Fine, do a primary. You want to pull a name out of a hat? The state shouldn't be able to tell a party how they pick their candidates. And that's what they did. It, it, you know, interesting thing about that, too, which is that that was written so it only applies to the Republican Party. I'm amazed they haven't sued over that. Did you know that? Um, because they, okay, so they set the number of signatures you must gather to get onto the ballot and run through the signature category. It's not a percentage of the voters in the district, it's a flat number. Okay, so if you wanted to run for state house, for instance, you must collect a thousand signatures from the voters of the party you want to run with. Well, in like 24 out of the 29 counties, that means only a Republican could potentially, you know, get a thousand signatures from signatures of Republicans. Um, the average, the average House district in the state has approximately 275 registered libertarians. If you wanted to collect a thousand signatures, you'd have to do the most amazing recruiting drive first. You couldn't possibly pull that up. So it's purely a punishment for Republicans. It's amazing that it's been allowed to stand. But yes, I absolutely would repeal it, no question. I will vote to repeal. And yes, I need to get off because we need to let some other people speak. But thank you. I'll be over here. I'm happy to take more questions anytime. Uh, the website is shortforsenate.org. You can always contact me there. Thank you.
needy, mocking us. Now that is not the message that I want to see or hear. And as far as SB 54, because I came from California, we didn't have a caucus. Okay, but I became a state delegate and I vetted the um, candidates. SB 54 allows the candidates to snub their nose at the delegates. Okay? I don't have to talk to you because I'm already on the ballot. And I will tell you right now that I experienced that with Mr. Ellison. Okay? Now, I had, whenever I would go to Willie Billings meet and greets, Willie Billings spoke very highly of Joseph. Excuse me. Would never say anything bad about Joseph. So it's like, you know, we've got the same person almost running. <coughs> and we're going to win no matter which. What happens? Well, I ran into Joseph Ellison at a place of business, and I said, Hi, my name is April Pinkston, and I'm a state delegate. I would like to know why I should vote for you over Willie Billings. And he said, Well, there are many reasons. So I said, okay, great. And I set myself down, and I was willing to listen because I already knew who I was voting for, but I wanted to go back and tell all the people in my precinct, this is why I'm voting for Willie instead of Joseph. Okay? Well, all of a sudden, Joseph looked at his wife and says, I have to go. And they went off ran off into the sunset, totally blew me off, never got back with me, and then he started lying about me in the community. Okay? But again, this is not about Joseph. Okay? This is about knowing who is going to be in office. And if they're going to treat us like this now, what are they going to do when they get to Salt Lake City? They don't answer to us now, so they're certainly not going to answer to us later. And so that is what I'm concerned about, because I spent my life savings to get to Utah. I can't just pick up and move again. And even if I move again, that's no guarantee. Anyway, so God has called me to bloom where I'm planted. Okay? I'm here. And I want to save Utah. I want to save Washington County. And so, like I said, I was thrilled with the caucus. And I want you to be able to answer to me because my vote, and to your question, I've heard that. I'm old enough to be your mama, maybe old enough to be your grandma. Okay? I've heard that all my life. Oh, you better not vote for them because it's automatic shoe in for such and such, so and so. So for many years, I voted for the lesser of two evils. No more. Okay? I can't do it. Because my vote is sacred, and I answer to God. And he founded this country. George Washington was so convinced that God was the author of this country. He told his troops at Valley Forge that to take God's name in vain was an act of treason. Okay. So we need to get back to that, and that's all. And with that, I would like to introduce my dear friend, Patricia Kent, and I'm so thankful that she is running. And we need her <laughs>
43 years ago, I sat in a college classroom at Weber State. I was studying political science. Not because I wanted to be a political scientist, but because I really wanted to get my teaching certificate and the classes that I was taking in business administration that I had to go to Logan for, and I wasn't willing to drive through Sardis Canyon all the way to get it. So I just switched over because I love history, and at the time, I could do political science sort of as a, you know, as self-paced thing to get out of it. When I graduated from Weber, I said this, I will never, ever get involved in politics. <laughs> it is the most dirty, the most evil organization I have ever I had a college professor when he first started, his hair was down to here, he looked like the typical 60s, 50s. Okay? I walked into class one day and his hair's cut, beard's gone, he's, he's in a suit and we're all going, where did this come from? And I said, hey, Julander, what's going on? And he said, I'm running for public office and nobody's going to vote for me if I look like I did yet. <laughs> They play the game. I learned how to lie, cheat, and steal. I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to cheat, and I'm not going to steal this election, but I am going to win it. I love America. I like April and Rebecca. Sorry, but I can't talk about that without... There is nothing that I would not do for my freedom and your freedom. And if that means going to my grave for that, then I will do that. But this is a sacred covenant land that God gave us so we could be free. I don't know if you've ever really thought about this. We are the only only nation in the planet Earth that has had total freedom ever. Ever. And we're losing it. So I broke my oath never to get involved when I saw what was going on when Clinton became president. And then heaven help us when we got Obama. I mean, he made, he pulled out no stops. He just simply rolled over us like a steamroller and said, I'm, I'm God and I'm taking over this nation. Well, what we have now doesn't exist. Last week I had a reporter from the Salt Lake Tribune call me. And he said, can I ask you some questions about your race? And I said, certainly. He said, my first question is, do you believe that Joe Biden actually won in 2020? And I said, no. And, and he said, why? And I said, I have two reasons. Number one, I don't believe the American people are that stupid. <laughs> St. George News. Three, say, three weeks ago by St. Yep. George News, they have never published a thing about it. I also emailed them, no reply, the about, about a week ago. Part of what I do is I'm a 
what I said, but they called my Liberty Action Coalition organization a left-wing organization and put us down, which that's fine. I mean, I became, I, I won my badge in 2014 as a domestic terrorist when I stood with the Bundys in Bunker Hill. Okay? <laughs>
Because in 2016, when Donald Trump became president, we had a House and a Senate that were both run by Republicans, and they destroyed it because of their hatred for one man who was trying to help America. That tells me they're not where they should be. Okay? I don't blame anybody in Washington, D.C. for the mess we're in. I blame you, and I blame them. Because we have sat on our butts so long and let them do whatever they wanted to do, and we've done nothing. I've gotten to the point, fortunately, it wasn't hard. I've thrown things at my TV as I listened. <laughs> I've yelled and screamed at the top of my voice saying I can't handle this anymore. I have complained to my neighbors. The time for yelling and screaming and throwing is over. Right. We have to do what the Lord says to do. This is his country. He blessed us to be here. And those of you who have heard me before have heard me say, the Lord gave us the answer in 2 Chronicles. He said, if my people who are called by my name will repent, humble themselves, and call upon me. Three things. I will heal their land. He didn't say, I'll show you how to do it. He said, if you will just humble yourself and repent and ask me, I'll, call, I'll do it. I'll heal this land. We need to repent. And we need to get active. We need to quit talking and we need to act. Literally act. How do you do that if you don't know what this is? If you do not know what your rights are, you cannot stand up for them. And you can read this and think you know, but I am here to tell you 99% of us have no idea the blessing that this is in our lives and the freedom it gives us. Okay? Why? Because this document was given to us by God. He asked 55 men to come together and he inspired them to put it together. But this is God's document. And anybody who is hell-bent on getting rid of it is on the adversary side. Bottom line. We need to know this, and we need to know what our rights, and then we need to stand up for them. Why did the Bundy boys spend two years in federal prison, half of that in lockdown, and solitary confinement? Because they knew their rights, and they were not willing to comply. And people say, yeah, but I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to leave my family. I don't want my wife and my children out here. I don't want, I don't want that. I've been with Scott Nielsen for the last two days, talking with him about his experience. He's still traumatized by that, big time. You know what? If it means going to prison for standing up for what you believe and what you know is right and your rights, then you're in good company. Because look at all the people that have been in prison. Unjustly, unfairly put in prison. My number one, my number one hero that spent time in prison abused and tortured is Jesus Christ. So if you go to prison, you're in good company. You're in really good company. Our election is important. Your vote should be the most sacred thing you have. Because without that vote really counting, we are already in bondage. We are already slaves to those who have taken control of our electoral processes for their own personal gain. 
I'm not a Donald Trump. I can't say to you, when I am elected, I won't take a salary. But I will tell you this. When I'm elected, my salary will be cut by at least $30,000. Because I don't deserve, nor does anyone else in that position deserve, a six-figure salary, especially when they're not doing their job. Right. herself from this election, how fair do you think that's going to be? Right? Yes? If I could just make a suggestion, don't take any chances. Now is not the time to play. Fill out the bubble and write Patricia Kent. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's what it's going to take. We are doing everything that we possibly can. I have, I had 50,000 
thousand flyers donated to my cause. And we are taking them out to every neighborhood and every place we can. But I don't know if you've looked around lately. I've been here 42 years. There's a lot of new houses around here. So if you're willing to, to take flyers to your neighbors, I have two cases of them in my car. I would be happy to give them to you to take out. We have signs that we are, we've got all the small signs out. We've got big signs. The rest of those will go up tomorrow. But we have an event coming. I'll give you two events. Number one, on October the 18th at the Green Springs Club. HOA Club. Green Springs HOA Clubhouse. We'll give you the, it'll be out on, on uh, my website. It will be on Facebook and Instagram. We are having a meeting, and it's not about me. It's about one of my passions. I am absolutely in shock, and I abhor what I am watch, watching happen in St. George, and I don't know if it's happening over here, but our children are going to the Children's Museum, the carousel, and the water, whatever they call them. Splash bag. Splash bag. And having to put up with LGBTQ rallies with these guys hardly clad and showing pornographic movies. And so we are having we are having a meeting, and it's going to be a meeting to say, please come and tell us what put our heads together that we can figure out what we need to do to stop this from happening in our communities. And I will be speaking. Michelle Tanner will be speaking, and we have a guest speaker coming from up north. We hope. So they're not arresting. The, They're giving them permits to do it. Oh That's my right. God. In another city. I saw them. It was accepted and then they actually got arrested because of their no. The, no. Our city manager and mayor gave them written permission to do it. We've got to stop. If I had if I showed that kind of movie oh, yeah. to my family, I'd be in prison. They'd throw me in jail. Absolutely. So we have that again. What time? It's going to be at 6 o'clock. 6.30. Um, 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. I don't know. I, they just tell me when I go. The other event I do not have a time for. Um, I was on the Splash Pad in St. George, but we're having a meeting here in Hurricane. The meeting, the meeting on the 18th is going to be at Green Springs. Um, when you turn off on Washington, like you're going to turn uh -huh. left and go to Costco, you turn right and go up in there, okay. and it's, it's right up. We'll have the address out. The other thing that we are doing, and um, I have to wait for Scott to get back. He is leaving tomorrow to take his family to Boston for two weeks to learn about the history of America. Um, but we are planning, and, and uh, I was hoping then it would be your final daughter. Is she at home? Yes. <laughs> I think they agreed to that meeting. I, my, my other kid is counseling and still is coming home tonight. I won't be home. He'd be here tonight. He'd come here. He won't be home for another hour. Well, maybe I can go wherever she is. I need to talk to her about this. But anyway, Scott is going to erect the tallest freestanding flagpole in North America. It will be over 500 feet. Guess what? Where? Well, guess what? It's going to be a hurricane. Everybody in the county hopefully is going to 
going to be there. He said, this is what he said. He called on me. He said, he said number one, he, he said, I know you don't remember me because you taught me in school. And I said, okay. <laughs> and, and so I had to go to my yearbook and look and see who he was. And, and then he said, we've got to get you elected. And we need a big event for it. And this is what I'm going to do, and you're going to be center stage of that event. And so it is going to be, it is going to be a fundraiser to help put the flag out. But it's more about letting the people out there know if you want, if you want voter integrity, if you want transparency, and you want somebody that is going to listen to you and do what for you what you deserve, then you need to vote for one of we the people, which is me.
with, here, we'll give you this little bit back. That's another thing that the county auditor is involved in, is property taxes and <coughs> determining the value of your homes. I won't even ask because I know all of you that own homes, your value, property value went up this year and your property taxes went up. Okay? It's not based on anything down here. It's all about the big boy. It's really all about the budget. Your county commissioners and your city people tell the auditor, we need this much money for our budget. And they, they work the figures, and that's how you get your assessment. Okay? Let's cut the budget. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I haven't been out 
handing out flyers and helping them. But we had a plumbing issue. And we had backup in our house. And what they found is that all of the pipes going into the city sewer are all destroyed. Well, the infrastructure of St. George is <coughs> in downtown. And she said, so we've had to con contact plumbers and do all this. And I said, that's the city's responsibility. Oh, no. They passed an ordinance that makes it the homeowners. Why are we paying utilities if they're not taking care of our infrastructure? We've got to educate ourselves on what's going on. We've got to say, no, we're not giving you any warning. We'll take care of our own problems because you're going to make us do it anyway at our expense. And then we're still paying you. We've got to take it back. My thing is cut spending. Cut all of the crap that we don't do.
blown, thrown out were not in, contained in Article 8 of the Constitution. So, and that seems to shock some people. Um, I, I think my constitutional credentials are, are fairly solid. Um, by the way, so Pat and I share a lot of friends. I think I can name uh, Sheriff Matt, who I was his campaign manager when he ran for governor of Utah several yeah. years ago. Um, longtime friend. Uh, Roger Roots um, is an attorney friend in Montana um, who is also very instrumental in the incredible win that happened in uh, Las Vegas when they uh, had the case against the Bundy thrown out by, by the federal judge. Um, I, I have some, we also have some other friends. I don't know if they'd be comfortable with their names. I know Roger and Sheriff Matt. So, um, but anyway, and, and it's going to be tough to follow follow Pat. I, I'll maybe just turn attention quickly to um, my signs. So, uh, and uh, please take a sign, take literature. Um, if we need to visit, by the way, afterwards, lay it on the, on the, the yard. If they take us out of here, we, we can do that. Um, I also take calls 24 7. I tell my clients, so I'm, I'm a defense attorney uh, mostly, and I tell my clients, as long as I'm conscious and I can hear the phone ring, I'll. And you may need to leave a voicemail message. Um, I don't take calls I don't recognize, but I'm, if I can return a call, I, I, I do try to return calls. Uh, I am pretty busy. I do have a day job as an attorney, and that's that's why it's been kind of frustrating. Just I have a lot of work to do, and um, it makes it difficult to campaign. So on, on that front, if you feel like you want to change in the county attorney's office, then I encourage you to. Go to my website, get a flyer, get a sign, spread the word, uh, get your friends. I, I, people have asked me, what's your win number? And I, I think based on past election cycles, you know, they really haven't had a contested race for county attorney for quite some time. Um, and, and so I think it's north of 30,000, 35,000 votes. So we'll, we will see what happens. There is no Democrat in the race. I'm on the ballot. It's a two-way race. And not only am I grateful, by the way, for earning the endorsement of Coalition. I'm, I'm a libertarian, so I'm very liberty-minded, so that's great, that fits. Um, and you may not be totally happy or down with that, but you should also know I do have an endorsement from the Equality Utah PAC. And you might listen to that and say, oh, wait, I don't know if we like Equality Utah. Their, their deal, and they didn't give me a perfect score, by the way, they gave me an A-. Um, but they still endorsed me. They thought, you know, I was better than the incumbent. And my, my deal with them was this. I'm not totally on board with your you know, positive rights agenda that you're trying to do, try to force certain things on people. However, if the state or if the government is going to extend some kind of benefit, then I think everybody needs to be treated equally. And, and they're down with that. And I think we're all down with that. Now, I'll say as a libertarian, I'd sure like to get the government out of a lot more stuff. And then, then we wouldn't have to worry about it. Then it would make it a political issue. So many of the fights in the culture wars I, I see are because government has got inserted itself into something. If we can get government out of that something, then we just live and let live. I'm a live and let live kind of guy. And that's the thing I, I put on my website. Um, as long as you're you know, not hurting people and not taking their stuff, um, I think you should be free to enjoy the blessing. Um, we talked a bit about elections, and, and even though the county attorney's <coughs> office is not so um, maybe related to the election issue, I, I did want to just point out I was also concerned when I saw the very close vote in this House District 72, and they did not do a hand count. And um, I've been an election attorney in my capacity as a libertarian chair and activist and whatnot, um, and have litigated some election issues. In fact, um, I think I'm the only attorney in Utah who sued the lieutenant governor twice. Um, the second one had the last name of Cox. And um, my co-counsel, by the way, was an attorney by the name of Dave. Schoen, I don't know if you know who David Schoen is, but he represented uh, Donald Trump in his impeachment trial. So we were co-counsel. Um, Susan Spencer Cox, there was an election law that we thought was not fair. Um, we didn't have to litigate it much. They agreed. And they just said, can you put this lawsuit on hold and we'll change the law? We put it on hold, came around the legislature and changed the law to make it fair for everybody. So, So um, let me get back to my sign and maybe one thing that would have been a run. So 
one of the URLs, because we're doing pumpkins with the URLs. URLs are internet addresses, right? So, um, and one I saw was dot family. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So, in the past couple of years, I have started doing something called parental and family representation. This is when uh, Child Protective Services, DCFS, gets involved in your family. Um, and so, oftentimes, they will try to terminate parental rights. And then the children maybe go with another family member. Oftentimes, there's no other family members or whatever step forward. Or what sadly I've seen, and I continue to see this, is that they had kind of an adoptive family in mind, and they try to keep the other family members, the kinship, away so they can't step forward and adopt. And um, then, then by the time they come forward, they say, oh, it's too late. They kind of bonded with the foster family. So we should not go over that family. Um, that's a problem. In, in, in the civil law, we call that the civil death penalty. Um, and so it's taken pretty seriously. I'm, I'm one of a few attorneys who works for what's called the Utah Indigenous Defense Commission. So um, I represent families in, in rural Utah, so class three through six counties. Washington County, by the way, is a second class county. Um, so I don't represent people in Washington County. I used to. Um, however, apparently I was too good at my job. Because what happened was I um, challenged a termination, um, took the case all the way up to the Utah Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals agreed with me that the termination was improper. The um, guardian ad litem's office, they represent what's called the best interest of the child. They appealed it up to the Supreme Court, and I successfully defended that decision at the Utah Supreme Court. Um, and, and that really was a landmark decision that protected family rights in Utah. And you can go, by the way, on to the, I put my web, campaign website up here. In fact, I'll click. Okay, also watch the video that's on um, about the pandemic. But if you go to the bio, oh, there we go. There's my smiling mug. And if you scroll down, I, I, I've linked to some documents that are related to kind of what ended up being the campaign not to renew my contract as a parental defender in Washington County. And, and some people didn't. Some late night comedians do like mean tweets. They're like, they put up their mean tweets. Some of these are mean tweets. They're from people in government who complained to the county that I was a horrible person because I was defending parental rights. And your parental rights, by the way, are fundamental constitutional rights. The Supreme yeah. Court said that. It's a fundamental right. And let's see. Well, I'll just click on this last one here because we. Talking about our county commissioners, that's the letter that Victor Iverson wrote me one week before I argued before the Utah Supreme Court that the county was not renewing my contract. And he called me on the phone, by the way, and and said, "We're not, you know, we're going in a different direction, kind of this folksy way." I said, "Oh, um, you know," I said, "That that's interesting. Would it be, you know, help, helpful to talk about it?" No, I don't think we're we'll available to talk about that. I said. You know, I said, I, I'm not aware of any clients that have complained about my representation of them. Would you happen to be able to tell me what this is about? And he says, well, I think you know why we can't talk about that. And, and here's, and I don't know to this day um, what their reason was. When you go look at those documents, Angela Adams, who's a deputy county attorney who does adoptions on the side, so she moonlights as an adoption attorney. Every time I prevented a family from being split up and their kids adopted out, that was a potential fee that she lost. So she, there's an email you'll have there where they were. She reached out to the attorney for DCFS and talking about. They, so they ended up creating this committee called the Washington County Indigent Defense Committee and put people on there. Well, the first time around, we all met and, and they're like, "You're just Rob Lake. You're just doing your job. You're defending people. So there's nothing wrong with that." So they recommended my contract be renewed. Um, then when I knew that DCFS and other people were doing this kind of stuff, I started subpoenaing them to court. Because my, my parent clients were saying, we want you as our attorney because you're actually fighting for us. Um, and you know, we've had other attorneys who have not fought for us. Um, and so they, they were concerned. Um, and, oh, that's my phone. Okay. Oh. That's going to go. Um, so, so 
So I, I, I was saying I was starting, so I ended up starting subpoenaing people from this indigent defense committee and also Nicole Felshaw, the county administrator. When I, I've been told indirectly that that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. And, and, and so we're getting back to why I ran. Um, when you go, let's see. Uh, there we go. This language that says Eric Clark prepared an objection to the subpoena. So I ended up doing a grandma request. We all know what a grandma request is, right? Yeah. Yes. Records access management matters. And I ended up getting up, I just said, give me all the emails that have my name in it. Um, and so they gave me a lot of stuff, but they withheld, they said, over 200 emails. And, and I, I went to what's called the State Records Committee. I said, I should be entitled to see those emails. They're about me. But I did get this draft objection to one of my subpoenas. And um, this was from the part when he was still the deputy county attorney. So Brock Belknap was the county attorney. By the way, two weeks after um, Victor told me they weren't renewing my contract, Brock Belknap resigned. And some people say, well, it's because he took this cushy Washington Conservancy, Water Conservancy District job. Um, Others suggest maybe it was related to this. Um, so anyway, what he said was, we, you know, Washington, this was a draft. They never ended up having to file this objection to the subpoenas for Nicole Felshaw and others because DCFS said, hmm, we don't want our division director and these other people testifying in court, so we're just going to give the, the kids that to Rob's client. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how we solved it. And, you know, that's a good thing for my clients, right? So we don't need to air that dirty line. But when I read through this, these uh, objections, I thought, there's a lot of false information in there. I said, this attorney is willing to make false representations in court. That tells me a lot about that attorney. And so you've got that personally, so you've got an issue. So that's one reason I was motivated to run. So I filed, um, I'll, I'll take this off the screen. Um, I filed. And then I learned of um, the incumbent circulating around a letter about a sitting state legislator, Kevin <coughs> Signal, who I am, am so grateful with and uh, had a decent relationship with. When we were speaking of the Libertas Institute, Travis Signaler had a very high rating from the, the Libertas Institute. So I was supportive of him, but for whatever reason, the incumbent thought that he wasn't sufficiently involved with local law enforcement. Um, so he sent around a letter trying to get him defeated, I guess, at the convention. I don't know if that worked or not. I know there was a little incident with the hunting deer on somebody's property, and that he had the family thing where he said, well, I'm just going to go farm on some family property. And that, that's all well and good. So he, go, he went and did that. And then, of course, now we have this election. And, um, you know, I think that guy said, well, why aren't they not doing a complete camp count? I will say this. Utah law, I think, is vague on this question, but if that, that means that county officials would have some discretion as, as to how you would do it. I think I would want to see a hand count. And, and by the way, this stuff about hand counts are inaccurate. Many modern democracies around the world yeah. hand count their ballots, and, you know, and, and they, yes, they can be inaccurate if you do it in the wrong way, but these modern countries, these modern democracies do it in the right way. So they, they they have, you know, uh, high accuracy rates of counting. Um, so I, I frankly don't see why, why we can't do both. Um, so I don't want to, you know, belabor too much. I know we're getting late in the day. I just kind of want to maybe give you that backstory as to what motivated me, me to run and um, just give you some, again, of my maybe, maybe background and how I got here um, and, and why I'm running. And, you know, I, I look at my bar number. So my bar number is 6915. Um, that means I was the 6,915th attorney to get a license in the state of Utah. The, the incumbent's number is in, in the 13,000. The 13, yeah, 13,000. So tw twice as much. And I just, I think when he got in, I, so I've been practicing a lot. I may look like a young guy, but I'm kind of old. I'm 53. Um, so uh, I've been practicing a lot more than a quarter century. So uh, twice as much. Anyway, I'll leave it there.
you have some questions. Yes. Dana from Seattle. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> First, I want to give a little bit of backstory, and then I want to ask you how you would handle it. So I've spoken with Eric Clark twice regarding the issue with pornography in schools. The first time it was with um, other uh, moms from the group, you know, kind of holding the school board accountable. We had a Zoom call with him. He started out by saying, first, he wasn't willing to spend the political capital. So we're like, not as a county attorney, could you approach it as a dad? He basically said he didn't have jurisdiction. Then a question was asked about election integrity, or you know, did he believe there was any fraud? He said, no, I don't believe there's any fraud. Uh, fraud. I've been to the county. Um, you know, there might be, you know, the missionary mom. And I did think about it at the time. That's still illegal. Okay. The second time I had a Zoom call with him, it was a, a part of a vetting process, and it came up about, I'm just letting everybody else know on the panel that, hey, I've been on a Zoom call with Eric. Eric, I just want to bring you guys up to speed. But I know, and he was like, yeah, I, I remember the call. And again, proceeded to say that he didn't have jurisdiction. So I let it go by because there was many other questions. And then when we finished the call out, I said, well, I have a question for you. If you're the county attorney, the county attorney, and we're dealing with a county entity, which would be the Washington County School Board, if you don't have jurisdiction, by all means, you must know who does. Pause for a minute. And he said that it would be him. To this day, we have not gotten the help from the county attorney. We have worked with le the legislature on HB 374. Ms. Hodges has been very influential in dealing with the school district to do it. But it's been zero help from like one of the, you know, one of our chief law enforcement officers here in Washington County. Question, why does the school district be exempt from state laws? And number two, as a county attorney, what would you have done or what will you do if we're still dealing with this issue about getting pornography and indecent material out of Washington County public schools in their libraries? Two, two good questions, thank you. So um, the, the first one's pretty easy. I mean, well, school districts are not exempt from state laws. So, I, I don't know where we get that. So, the state not, And just to clarify, not that he said they were exempt, but my point is, is if you grab some of that pornographic material and they have it in school and they won't remove it, you go outside the school building and you hand it to one of my daughters, you're going to jail. So what's, how do they get away with it? Um, and again, it's a great, I mean, and I will say, I can't, I can't just, give a legal opinion, you know, off, off the cuff. That's just not how it works. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time sitting at a computer, and I have a legal research database, and I do what's trying to call find the law. Um, you just don't, you know, it's, it's a huge body of law, and, and um, there's complex issues, and, and this is a complex issue, actually. So I, I will say, I hear the concern, and, and I'll say this. So as an attorney who works in Washington County Juvenile Courts for several years. I would deal with stuff. Now, we have kids here, so I'm going to keep them on the premise. But, um, you know, we would have kids that would get involved with other kids. And, and the question would come up, where did the kid get the idea to do this thing? And so were they exposed to stuff? And, and so that, that's certainly the concern then, if we're getting exposed to the stuff at their school, then that's problematic, right? Um, I will say as a libertarian, I support the separation of school and state. So that's going to be my strongest argument. If you know, if we don't have, I don't know if this is happening at you know Liberty Academy or George Washington Academy or, or whatever. Um, but again, it, it's it's just too bad that it's a state-run or a government-run entity because then it makes it a political issue. And and I would rather these things not be a political issue. I'd rather if you want to be a parent that has this kind of content in your school, you can take it there. You know, you can send your kid there. If you don't want your kids to have that. Don't send their kids. Now, what about if the kids from two different schools play together and what's the content like? Well, maybe as a parent, you've got to be more careful in, in protecting your kids. So, because would you help parents, though, in that case, if you had residents of Washington County and they use the public school and they pay that? Would you, I mean, would you I mean, help? I actually want to, want to listen and, and, and see, you know, what, what's possible there. Um, you know, 
myself because there are laws on the books on presenting um, PowerPoint materials to right. minors. I'm just going to say, you know, I'm, I'm not a censorship guy, but I, I think libertarians are different when it comes to kids. Yeah. So, we, you know, we think a lot of the things, you know, we want to legalize adulthood, um, but we recognize that kids are different. So, one thing about kids, by the way, I know some people say, oh, do an adult crime, do the adult crime. No, I'm actually, they're even talking about raising the age of minority up into the lower 20s because they're finding that young people's brains are still wiring and still, even though they look like miniature adults, they're still not quite, you know, there yet. So, anyway, interesting point. I'll, let me go to the gentleman in front of you. Quick. I, I appreciate you providing us the backstory on your relationship to the county. Uh, the question I have is there state laws that define boundaries for county attorneys as to who they advise? I know they act as an advisor capacity to county uh, leaders and employees. And even state departments, if you read through the county attorney statute, right. health department. I, I see this existing county attorney. Uh, I kind of define him as a monkey and a man. He, he deals with so many different things, mm -hmm. and it, it doesn't appear he has any boundaries. Uh, so, you know, it, with, especially when it comes to election law. Uh, I'm not sure how he can advise the county clerk to recuse herself as, a, as the election official of Washington County because that's her own capacity. You can't just say, I'm not going to do this. And, and I mean, this is the first time I've heard this tonight, and I don't know what is possible there. And again, that, that would be something that I would want to use it's an interesting issue. I mean, you, you would think, I, I think I've heard of that happen in some cases where the person in the contested race refuses themselves, but I've also, just living around Utah, know it's pretty common for a local election official to be administering an election in which they are also a candidate. And maybe that just means there needs to be a change in the law. We don't think that's the right way to go. Doesn't that appear to be a neglect of duty, though, of your election official to conduct yourself in elections as the election official, how can you just say, I'm not going to do that, but then show up for the certification <coughs> to defend the election? It, it, it's a great question. And you know, Utah, in a lot of ways, is, is a young state. And a lot of other, because I research legal issues in, in Utah, I sometimes will look to other states because they've just had a long, longer time to have these issues kind of percolate up and, and you know, you look for it decide what the right way forward is. And um, so I suspect that a lot of other states have figured out a way how to navigate that kind of question, but I don't know that we've just hit the time where we've had to bring that support to Utah. So, but, but it's a good question. I mean, I'm an election law geek, so that kind of stuff really interests me. Maybe we could look. Oh, this gentleman here. Was uh, Lewis within her legal uh, ability to not do hand retail when requested? It's a great question. I'm going to come back to the, I, I would want to sit down and research that. My, my, my informal, non-legal opinion is that she had discretion because the law is so vague right now. So, um, but again, if I looked at it deeper, I might change my mind. Okay, way in the back. You. <laughs> Are you in favor of spending tax dollars on providing um, addictive substances? No, but that, but you know, I'm not in favor of spending tax dollars for anything. So. Okay, but in school, we spend tax dollars to buy pornography or tax dollars to buy alcohol. Would you be in favor of tax dollars being spent for that? I mean, no, that's that's pretty simple. Thank you for a clear answer. Yes. So, question: Do you know Eric Clark? Of course, you work with him. I, I, what's funny is I was in juvenile court with mine, and um, Eric, as an attorney, right? Um, and, uh, and, and Eric Clark was filling in for Angela Adams, who's the normal prosecutor there. So I, you know, I, I know my way around there. I ended up having to kind of show him, like, now you're going to do this, Eric. Now you're going to do this. And he, he was gracious enough. So, and, and, and you do that as attorneys, it's kind of, you know, you're, you are a professional, so you can get things done rather than waste the court's time, and waste the party's time, you show up. So, um, I, you know, I, there was a time where, I, and I still like to think we would have a professional relationship. I negotiate cases with, with his deputies. Um, I have several pending, you know, their rights.
right now. I do take private cases on top of my court appointed cases. Um, but again, my I have this experience and other experiences from other folks that I go, there, there's a character issue here, and I know I can do a better job, so I'm going to offer myself as an alternative, and we'll see what the county does with that. So, so my experience and personal with and knowledge. Salt Lake City, Holy Cross Hospital, which is no longer there. I think it's called something else. I think it's the same now. Um, and then law school at the University of Utah College of Law. I went to Olympus High School, you know, in the Salt Lake area, Titan. And then I got a full scholarship to the University of Southern California, so I'm a Titan and a Trojan. <laughs> but also a U. So I love my U's. And they're going to be a CLA tomorrow. Thank you so much and help yourself to some goodies. Thank you.